Hello, it's Howard Rheingold. I've become convinced that understanding how networks work is one of the most important literacies of the 21st century. I want to make some connections between the work of some thinkers and doers who have approached networks from different angles and to encourage you to look at their source material. These people include the architects of the original internet, especially David Reed, law professor Lawrence Lessig and his notion of code as law, Manuel Castell's overarching vision of the network society, the more recent discoveries by uh, sociologist Duncan Watts and others about the way the structure of networks affects the way they perform, the connection between ancient human social networks and the modern digital networks that, that amplify those old capabilities, and in particular, uh, my work in virtual communities and smart mobs about the ways humans appropriate communication media to self-organize collective action on their own behalf. And finally, I, I, I want to echo Yohai Benkler's warning that legal and regulatory and political issues about copyright law, intellectual property, and network neutrality are not just small and technical issues, but really are ethical conflicts over individual freedom versus institutional control. The institutional, social, and technological forces I touch on here intersect in the domain of knowledge about the structure and dynamics of networks. Often the very people that I encourage to learn more about how networks work don't understand what this scientific and technical domain has to do with their everyday concerns about society and their place in it. So I want to take a few minutes not just to briefly summarize what these different thinkers have to say and to encourage you to, to look at the source documents, but to persuade the uninterested that it is in your best interest to understand what Reed, Lessig, Castells, Watts, Benkler, and myself are trying to say. Understanding how networks work in general and understanding the technical underpinnings of digital communication networks is not just a matter of engineering, but also a question of freedom. Not strictly technical, but also social. When it comes to the underlying code that moves the bits around, the structure of the net is not just about programming, but about the location of control. Whether you look at the issue as a citizen, as a potential entrepreneur, a, a scientist, a journalist, or a cultural producer, what you know or don't know about how networks work can influence how much freedom, wealth, and participation you and your children will have in the rest of this century. I'll start with Larry Lessig because his appropriation of William Mitchell's quote, Code is Law, as the title of his book, really frames the issue about networks, and not just uh, networks, but other ways in which technical architecture affects human communication. Lessig brought up a few points, some of many he made in the book. First, structure matters. Whether you're talking about the structure of programming code or the structure of laws and regulations, codes such as these are created. They don't grow, uh, although you might say that they evolve once they're created. Secondly, government regulations and laws, uh, market ownership and control, and the way underlying software is configured, all can influence the structure and therefore the, the dynamics of systems uh, in which humans communicate. And finally, that architecture, both in the sense of legal code and the sense of programming code, confers control. The central question in issues of control over digital networks is whether that control will be decentralized and diffused throughout the population that uses it, or whether it will be centralized 
and controlled, whether it's by a, a state or a private owner. We're seeing battles in places like China over whether the state can control what people do with the network. And we're seeing battles in places like the USA over whether the, the companies like the cable companies that bring broadband access to most Americans can control what kind of content is carried over their networks. I think it's important to understand that the architecture of control, or as Tim O'Reilly calls it, the architecture of participation that made the web possible grew directly from an architectural decision that was made by the, the people who created the protocols of the original internet. Internet, of course, stands for uh, internetworks. There were a number of different digital networks, each speaking different languages that were merged together to create the internet. And that was done by creating a very simple set of protocols, rules for the way in which data is carried on that network. These are the internet protocols. Technically, it's called TCP IP. We don't need to go into what uh, transmission control protocol slash internet protocol means, except that it differed very much from the way information had been moved around communication networks before. If you think about the telephone network and you think about those old movies about telephone operators using switchboards, what they were doing was literally connecting circuits so that when you made a call from one site and your voice traveled over the network to the destination, a complete electrical circuit existed by patching together different circuits between you and the destination. That, of course, was centrally controlled by the network operator, by the, by the telephone company. When uh, computer engineers wanted to send bits around to connect computers uh, during the first ARPANET uh, underlying uh, the internet, that they decided to use the packet switching network that had been invented by Paul Barron at the Rand Corporation some years before. Now, Barron specifically had been interested in communication networks that would survive nuclear attacks. It's not true that that's uh, why the packet switching is used for the, the internet. The whole idea of packet switching is an, instead of having a, a central network that, that creates circuits from end to end, you put the address of the destination into the little packet of data that you send out from the origin. You also include the, the form of media, whether it's, it's voice or a computer program or, or video, and you include the actual content. Every computer on the network, rather than a, some kind of central control, looks at the packets that move through it, looks at the address, compares it to an internal map, which it maintains and, and which is transmitted through the network, and it throws that packet in the right direction. So if one route doesn't work, another route will. That's, that's the part that works when large parts of the network go down, whether it's through a, a, an electrical blackout or uh, literally having the nodes being blown up in some kind of war. But that's not the point. The point is that control of the network is decentralized. And when the original architects of the internet protocols started creating the architecture of the overall network by creating the rules by which data could be sent through that network, they realized that they did not know what would be done with the network in the future. It's something that can carry bits, and bits can represent all kinds of things. They didn't want to constrain that by building some form of control structure into the network at the beginning. So what is known as the end-to-end -end principle constrains uh, the power of uh, any central force in the network to control what people on the ends do. So if you are a physicist in Switzerland, like Tim Berners-Lee, and you want to reconfigure the internet to include links and uh, networks of links, then you can create the World Wide Web. As long as the code uses the TCP IP protocols, there's nobody that you have to ask permission of uh, in order to uh, apply a new form of using the network. So in 1991, 92, 93, only a very few people in the world used uh, Berners-Lee's World Wide Web. It started growing 
1993 when NCSA created the Mosaic browser, but there was only one website in California at the beginning. It just grew. There were all kinds of other networks uh, that rode on the internet, like Hytelnet or, or uh, uh, Gopher Space that were competing, but the World Wide Web went out, uh, not because anybody made a central decision, but because it was widely adopted. Again, more recently, when uh, Google was created in a, in a dormitory room, uh, the, the kids who created it, they didn't have to ask somebody to rewire the central control. So that's the end-to-end -end principle. And one of the architects of the end-to-end -end principle who wrote about that was David Reed. David Reed more recently formulated what he called Reed's Law, describing, about, uh, describing the way value in networks changes uh, with the way those networks are used. Next, I want to talk about the way the value of networks, both in terms of political power and economic wealth, changes as the way people use those networks and the way the networks are configured to enable people to use it change. Then I want to talk about the ways in which these technical networks amplify and extend the ancient and, and perhaps fundamental human capability of forming social networks, something that long preceded the telephone, the telegraph, the internet.